Hey Cheryl, you challenged me to find a volcanic rock, but you do realize that I actually live at the base of an active volcano, right? So if I turn around and we look out the window, so that mountain back there is the active volcano of Pichincha. So let's go up it. Turf Wars, a battle of wits, knowledge, and creativity. Which naturalist will prove they're the best? Choose your fighter and watch the action unfold on Turf Wars! So the best way to get up the mountain is in this cable car. It's called the Teleferico. And so let's go up and see the volcano. So this whole trip takes about 18 minutes to get from the base, which is about 9,000 feet, all the way to the top, which is about 14,000 feet. I think technically it drops you out at 4,050 meters. So a little bit, a little bit up there. It's really interesting through this trip because you can really start to see at the base where we have a lot of invasive eucalyptus and then we move up and you can see kind of more shrubby like native trees that can actually grow at high altitudes and then eventually you get to the top where there's just you pass the tree line where it just becomes grass and this whole ecosystem is considered the paramo there's many different types of paramo but it's basically montane grassland stuff very descriptive i'm a naturalist one of the things that I love about this is that you can really see how Quito is nestled into the valley between all of these different volcanoes that has shaped its history over the past couple thousand years or so and will continue to shape its history into the future. Team, even though it was sunny this morning when I planned to do this video, it is now not sunny anywhere. However, we have made it to the top. We're sitting right around 14,000 feet and you can see the lovely city of Quito behind me. That's where I live. So now that we're at the volcano Pichincha, let's talk a little bit about it. Well Cheryl, before we start talking about some volcanic rocks like this one that I'm sitting on, <laughs> well to be honest I don't know much about this one that I'm sitting on other than it's a rock and it came from that volcano. Anyway, before we get too far along I thought that now would be a great time to rate your challenge. You found me way more than five pieces of art and I loved every single one of them, even the ones where there were agricultural themes. I think a lot of people are so disconnected from nature that we think that plants that we eat aren't nature, but they definitely came from somewhere and they definitely are plants. So I definitely count them. I said I was gonna give you a star for each one and what, you gave me like seven or something? So are we doing it out of a 10 star rating now? Got it out. I think you nailed it. <laughs> Just leave it at that. And before we start walking any closer to up there to that peak, we're not going to make it all the way. We're definitely not making it all the way. Definitely not. But before we start, you know, getting a little bit further up the hill a little bit, I thought that I would take this chance to show off some other people who have participated in the challenges. First one comes from Thomas. And he said, I saw your latest turf word video with a request for an art containing insects and other animals. Drawing in animals with preferably more than four legs have been the main interest for most of my life, all self-taught. And about the year ago, I got the possibility to exhibit my drawings in an art gallery in my hometown of Klagenfurt. I'm sorry, I pronounced that wrong. In Austria. <laughs> So I started to draw more professional and finished 32 pictures in total. And so I'll show you a few of them here. And Thomas goes on to say, I want people to be more interested in wildlife, so I try to explain the most important facts of each drawn animal and pair it in a short text. I discovered your channel while doing research on the pink katydids and instantly subscribed. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And that is your reminder, fellow love bug, to also subscribe. I just wanted to say just how beautiful and accurate these drawings are. I really like the contrast between the stark white skulls and the beautifully colored insects on them. It's just so, so beautiful. You are so talented and it's obvious that you've put so much hard work into these and they're just absolutely stunning. Bob found the Frog Bridge in Willimantic, Connecticut and says that in June of 1754, there were loud noises all throughout the night. 
Some citizens thought that they were demons and other supernatural beings coming down the mountain. Others thought that they were being invaded by the French since it was widely believed. The morning revealed thousands of dead frogs surrounding one of the ponds in the area. There was an unusually severe drought that year and most of the ponds had dried up. Frogs descended to the one remaining pond and had a territorial fight to the death for the remaining water. Note that the frog sits atop a spool of thread since Willimantic is known as the Thread City. And that is so interesting and I also love how the frogs are uh, pandemic equipped with their masks. Wear your masks, folks! And finally, Biker Dave showed some cool examples of some animals surviving extreme environments. And he lives in California and says, when it comes to extremes, I can think of no better place than the intertidal zones we call tide pools. All the creatures that live here deal with it in all. Being both predator and prey, extreme temperatures that can go from 60 degrees Fahrenheit to 110 degrees Fahrenheit in less than an hour and surviving variations in water pressure that are like living in the direct stream of a fire hose. Did you know that breaking waves exert forces of 250 to 6,000 pounds? Wow, the tide pools of California probably don't see three tons of pressure, but I almost drowned once under some pretty heavy surf. So here are some organisms that can handle those extreme tidal pools. I wanted to thank all of you love bugs for submitting and don't forget that you can always participate in all of the challenges. Here we are, we've made it a little bit, not very much, but a little bit up the way of the volcano Pichincha. Pichincha is still an active volcano, although the point that you may be able to see behind me, ah, is it okay? That point is Ruku, which means uncle in Quechua, and that is the old point and is no longer the active part. The active part is called Wawa, which is the Quechua word for baby, and it's to the west. I would point to the west, but I actually don't know where west is. <laughs> You can visit and you can walk all the way up to Ruku if you want to. I am not the kind of person that likes to walk all the way up there, although I definitely have friends who do, and if it is something that you are interested in, it is 100% possible to do that. But before I get into volcanic rocks, let's talk a little bit about how Pichincha explodes. There are some volcanoes that explode violently and have lava all over the place. There are some volcanoes that just kind of ooze lava off the back side of them. And Pichincha is one of those volcanoes that likes to burp gases, ash, and sometimes hiccup mudslides down it. The different types of volcanoes and volcanic eruptions have definitely shaped Ecuador and have definitely shaped Quito as Pichincha is not the only volcano that is particularly close to Quito. Pichincha lasts hiccuped in 1999 when it deposited a thin film of ash everywhere in the city. However, one of the big explosions was in 1553 and that deposited a foot of ash everywhere in Quito and ash deposits were found up to 600 miles away. So yeah, it hiccups sometimes. One of the major concerns in Quito is that we will have another ash eruption, or worse, that we will have a mudslide that will take with it many kinds of volcanic rocks. And I will show you evidence of that soon. Not here, but soon. You can see evidence of the destruction of the volcanoes, including Pichincha, all throughout Quito. And I'm excited to bring you to a place to actually show you some of the civilizations that were actually buried by ash thousands of years ago because of some of the volcanic eruptions. These volcanoes, because of their volatile nature, were considered to be deities and gods, and the people often prayed to them. So now onto some rocks. I didn't bring you up here for nothing. I really like bringing people here. Not only is the landscape absolutely gorgeous, but you can find lots of volcanic rocks, and some of my favorite are pumice. So tourist attractions and other distractions aside, They recently installed this swing, and I must say, it's definitely like my favorite thing ever. Here's some native trees that live here. These are called polylepis, and they're really neat because they're also called paper trees, because their bark just kind of comes off like paper. So anyway, they're a cool native plant here. I feel like we're gonna do throwbacks to old challenges. So this bird is a scavenger, it is called a kurikinge, and it's a really important animal up here in the Paramo. 
This scavenger is really important for keeping the Paramo waterways clean, and those waterways are responsible for giving Quito its tap water. Like me, I live down there. Thank you for giving me my tap water and keeping it clean. <laughs> the Curiquingues have a really characteristic way of walking. It's kind of that little running motion, and they prefer to kind of run around the Paramo than, rather than actually fly. This little bird got so close to me, I really did feel like I was visited by a mountain spirit. I really liked how he kind of just overlooked the city of Quito, like, hmm, yes, the peasants down there, before turning and flying off in, over the mountains. The Curiquingues have a special place in Ecuador's heart, and there is actually a song dedicated to them, and I'll put a little clip of that song right here. bringing people here not only because you can actually find some pretty cool insects when it's not cloudy and windy you can also see rabbits here's some rabbit fur and obviously some cool birds as we saw earlier but I also really like the geology while I'm not a geologist I just think finding your own personal pieces of pumice is just so much fun and like so cool but I love finding pumice and kind of just throwing it at people like think fast and they freak out but when they catch it obviously it weighs basically nothing because it's just full of a bunch of holes, basically. You can't even tie boats to it. Your boat will float away. Pumice to me, I think is one of the most iconic volcanic rocks just because it's so obvious and kind of weird. Pumice is formed when rock at very high temperatures gets thrown out of the volcano. And when you have rapid depressurization of the rock and rapid cooling of the rock, you get all of these bubbles, which then form these holes in the pumice, making it super, super light and basically weigh nothing. You can find pumice all over this mountain. You really don't even need to look very far. It's just, especially in the places where the erosion happens and the washout happens, you just find it kind of everywhere, it's just, just like dirt, basically. Pumice has some uses. You can find it in the beauty industry. You can also find it in polishes and things meant to be abrasive because you can just grind it down into this pretty abrasive powder. I think, I mean, I don't do the whole spa thing, but I'm pretty sure there's people who have like pumice foot scrubs, and that's because it's good at sloughing off all that dead skin. You can also find pumice being used in concrete if you are wanting to make a lighter weight concrete than just regular rock and gravel and sand, you can use pumice. Well, Cheryl, I hope that you like learning about pumice and I hope that you like learning a little bit about Pachincha, but hang on tight because we are not done yet. We're also gonna go head down the mountain into the city of Quito behind me and look at some of the destruction that these volcanoes have done to the people way before us, although maybe they're a warning of what's coming, <laughs> and show you some cool buildings that were using natural materials found from the volcanoes here. See you down the hill. Bye. Hi, Cheryl. I know that I told you that I was going to show you a museum that featured civilizations that had succumbed to the volcanic eruptions in this area. However, that museum is closed today, so instead of me being in front of it and talking about it, I'm going to show you some pictures and some footage from the last time I was there. I'll be showing some pictures from the Museum Rumi Pamba here in Quito. It is an archaeological dig site and an ecological park right within the city limits. There were two distinct cultures living here and they were separated by thousands of years and two different volcanic eruptions. The first civilization was covered with about six feet of ash from a nearby volcano called Puluawa and the more recent civilization which was affected by Pichincha about 400 years before the Incans got here, so more recent, but definitely not very recently, is the civilization that we know much more about. 
Here you can see the archaeological dig site, and here would have been a small group of small houses along with a workshop that they dyed fabrics in and also worked with animal hides. The foundation is made out of these volcanic rocks. You can also see these volcanic rocks formed into walls here and a skull looking at Pichincha. These people were not sacrificial. They didn't do human sacrifices. However, this skull is not here by accident as it is looking at Pichincha and as I already established, the volcanoes were worshiped as gods. Only 5% of this park is excavated, so there's plenty more mysteries and answers below the dirt. All right, now onto this beautiful building behind me. But of course, I wanted to show you another example of volcanic rock because I am not an underachiever. I wanted to show off this beautiful church. This is La Compañía de Jesús in the historic district of Quito. La Compañía de Jesús is considered to be one of the most beautiful churches in the country. Inside the church, the entire thing is gilded in gold leaf from the floors all the way up to the ceiling. The construction of this church started in 1605 and took over 160 years to build. So you can see a variety of art styles inside. The two most common are the Baroque and also the Moorish. You can really see the Moorish influence with the geometric shapes of the paintings that you can find inside and also the symmetry of the church. However, beautiful the inside of the church is, I am going to talk to you about the outside of the church. The outside of the church is actually made out of a volcanic rock called andesite. The outside of the church was started in 1722 and wasn't finished until 1765 because of a long period of suspension in the middle. Andesite is a volcanic rock not too dissimilar to basalt. However, there are a few key differences. Andesite is a little bit lighter in color, is really fine grain, and is lower in magnesium and iron than basalt. It's also higher in silica, which means that it's not very good to be used in concrete. Andesite is a host rock for copper, and we have a lot of copper mining here in Ecuador because of all of the volcanic stuff that is happening. Andesite is actually named after the Andean mountains, and all the andesite that you can find on this church is locally sourced from a local quarry in the province of Pintag, which is only about an hour southeast from here, and other materials were brought in from the western slope of El Panacillo. All right, Cheryl, now it's time for your challenge. I told you about the locally sourced andesite on the outside of this church and also all of the gold interior. Most of that gold was locally sourced from Ecuador as well, and by sourced, I mean stolen from the indigenous people that lived here, but came from Ecuador. So for your challenge, I want you to find me a building or other piece of architecture that is using locally sourced materials. I want you to tell me a little bit about the materials and also a little bit about the history or the building itself. I will see you next week. Until then, don't forget that you can participate in these challenges by tagging us in these social medias right here. I will see you all very soon. Bye.